Welcome to Fast Break, a channel for anything and everything NBA related. This time we're going to look at how basketball has evolved over the years. Before we see how the game has changed, we have to look at how it was started. Basketball was created in 1891 by James Naismith, a PE teacher for Springfield College in Massachusetts. Naismith was just looking for a fun and healthy activity that his students could play during the winter. He called the game basketball, and it was played with peach baskets that were nailed to the wall on each end of the gym and a soccer ball. The ball was tossed up in the air in between players and played with two teams who could only score by throwing the ball into their opponent's peach basket. And yes, the peach baskets were not bottomless, so the ball had to be removed manually each time someone scored. There was also no dribbling, so the ball could only be moved by throwing the ball to another teammate. The game picked up some steam, and in just four years, the first college basketball game was played between the University of Iowa and Springfield College, who ended up beating Iowa 5-1. But this was only the beginning. Soon after, the first men's and women's basketball teams were formed, and by 1904, basketball had officially became an Olympic sport. Two years later, they ditched the peach baskets for a modern hoop made up of a metal rim, cloth net, and wooden backboard. This was just a change they needed to improve the tempo and scoring of the game. From this point until about the 40s, basketball saw the most changes in its lifetime. Everything from out-of-bounds ruling, court lines, substitutions, as well as redesigned basketballs and backboards. All of these changes were instrumental in evolving the game and making things more exciting, but also safer and more efficient. Basketball had college and professional level play, but in 1949, the game would change forever. The Basketball Association of America and the National Basketball League merged in 49 to create the National Basketball Association. Another change happened the same year. Coaching during the game was officially allowed. Prior to this, there was no coaching allowed during the game or even during a timeout, but coaching during halftime was. Leading into the 1950s, the manufacturing of basketballs became universal, so the technique of dribbling was implemented as the basketballs were more consistently shaped. Most shots at this time were taken close to the basket, and small players like Bob Cousy and George Yardley ruled the court. By the mid-50s, another big rule change came. The NBA introduced a 24-second shot clock after the lowest scoring game ever, 19-18. This eliminated the common stalling tactics being used by teams ahead in the game, since there was no way for the team behind to come back other than to foul. The first game with the new rule proved to be effective, with a score of 98-95. to The most popular ways to shoot at this time were the set shot or one-handed runner, and from close to the basket, it was the hook shot. By the late 50s and the early 60s, Big men had officially arrived and their presence was felt across the league. The NBA lived in the shadow of college basketball, but the 60s is when that changed. Players like Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain came into the league and immediately dominated, putting up stat lines that were unfathomable and still are. The game was fast paced, which sometimes led to reckless sequences. But unlike players in the 50s, most players opted for shots in the painted area. Very few players were shooting from far out. Also, most players dribbled with their right hand over 75% of the time, which is much different from modern day. In 1967, the game would forever change with the formation of the ABA, a league that would become a home for players that weren't quite good enough for the NBA. But the ABA wanted to set themselves apart from the NBA, and to do that, they used a multicolored ball, introduced three-point shots, and featured a game that was played above the rim rather than under. The 70s saw more change, but in a new way. In 1970, the average NBA player made 35K, and by the end of the decade, it skyrocketed to 180K. Before the 70s, players spent their summers working a second job, but this rise in pay allowed players to make life-changing money playing pro basketball. There were two reasons for this increase, the ABA and free agency. As the ABA grew, they started to rival the NBA. It caused bidding wars since the ABA owners offered significantly higher salaries while the NBA was more established. In the early 1970s, the ABA would sign its biggest star, Julius the Dr. Irvin, who would revolutionize dunking. Before this, there were put-back dunks, but that's about it. Irvin could windmill, rock the ball, go behind his back, his head, and other moves that no player had done with a basketball before. Despite the popular innovations and recognition from NBA players, the ABA was plagued with a series of bad business decisions. In the end, it could not make enough money on its own. So before the 1976-77 season, the ABA and NBA officially merged, with a plan to dismantle three ABA teams and incorporate their players into the NBA, while the other four teams would be absorbed by the NBA. They took from the ABA in more than one way and added a three-point line and a dunk contest. In terms of on-the-court play, the 70s introduced a jump shot and also above-the-rim play, most notably dunking. Off-ball movement and reading the defense also became much more prominent throughout the decade. As we enter the 80s, the NBA had a huge drug problem. Many arenas were half empty or worse on game nights. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson are two huge reasons why the league was revitalized in the 80s. But when David Stern became the commissioner in 1984, he knew for the game to grow they needed more viewers. With cable beginning to take off, he knew TV was the key. 
The average player salary shows just that. In 1980, it was 180K and reached 900K by the end of the decade. Another massive bump. In terms of play, even with the introduction of the three-point line in the late 70s, players still opted for close shots to the basket. With two bigs down on each block, the floppy action and cross screens were popular ways to generate offense. Doubling dominant post players was a chore and a half, especially with somebody like Kareem having mastered his unguardable hook shot. So when guards and ball handlers would feed the post, the defender guarding the passer would double the big down low. But the passer had no interest in keeping the defense honest and shooting an open three. The worse the shooter, the more space they were given while the defender struggled to be in the two places at the same time. An effective way to guard a post at this time and force a deep two. With no hand checking and no flagrant fouls, this is possibly the most physical decade in NBA history. In the 90s, everything was getting better. The shooters, ball handling, and isolation scoring. With dominant post players, the move was to still dump it down low, but for guards and wings, mid-range scoring became more prominent than it was in the 80s. Changing hard fouls to flagrants allowed for players like Michael Jordan to take less punishment and avoid major injury. Hand checking was also popularized in the 90s, which allowed defenders to steer offensive players away from the desired spot on the floor with one or both hands. This was much safer than the hard fouls in the 80s while also giving the defenders a chance to make a stop. At this point, your options were to commit to a double team or stay on your man. If caught in between, it was a legal defense. There was more spacing than in past decades, but that didn't stop big men like Hakeem Olajuwon from dominating inside. By the time we get to the new millennium, man defense seemed to have one major flaw. It did not account for Shaquille O'Neal. In the early 2000s, no other player could match Shaq's sheer size, and he regularly put up monster numbers. With the illegal defense rule gone and the implementation of zone defenses, the goal was to encourage ball movement and passing. But the underlying issue was Shaq. The zone defense allowed for teams to slow down Shaq and other big men while encouraging higher IQ play at the expense of patient scoring. ISO scoring also became less effective with the defensive three-second rule taking over for illegal defense. Instant replay was also implemented for review of certain last-second plays. By the mid-2000s, zone defense was in full effect and scoring was harder than ever. With physical defense, big men not being as effective and offensive players not allowed to express themselves, something had to change. So the NBA got rid of hand checking entirely which gave offensive players space that they needed to make offense prominent again. This change helped speed up the game and diminish the size advantage of its biggest players, while smaller players became much more effective. The 05 Suns are a team that perfectly represents this shift. As we move to the 2010s, the decade as a whole can be defined by three things, threes, analytics, and super teams. The first super team was technically the 08 Celtics, but it got taken a step further when LeBron announced he would be headed to South Beach to team up with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Small ball lineups started to be seen and the value of big men was at an all-time low. Spacing the floor and surrounding somebody like LeBron with shooters allowed for the driving kick attack to work better than ever. And this is when the three-pointer started to gain some real value, or rather, show its real value. Super teams were beginning to assemble and threes were falling at an all-time rate. What a time to be alive. Steph Curry is the poster boy for three-point shots. It only took 40 plus years to realize the value in shooting more threes. Steph was also part of one of the most infamous super teams the Warriors of the late 2010s. With Kevin Durant joining a team in Golden State that already had three All-Stars, this was peak player empowerment. Super teams and player empowerment heavily affected who played with who and the balance of the league. But the game itself was being influenced by analytics. This whole three-point revolution was data-driven. To put it simply, shooting 33% from three is the same points per shot as shooting 50% on two-point attempts. This has led to a five-out offense with versatile players all over the floor who can guard multiple positions and fight through or over screens. But the bottom line is, if you can't be a threat from three, then you'll be on the bench come playoff time. And that's where we are today. One last significant change was made prior to this past season. After the 2021 season, the league deemed flopping strictly forbidden, a trend which gained traction in the 2010s. No more foul hunting and jumping into defenders for easy calls. Less flopping meant less stoppages, which is a win-win for everyone. Players can do what they do best, and fans get more of an entertaining game to watch. It's very exciting. The game will keep changing through the years, and that's a good thing. It's what's supposed to happen. Make sure to let us know what video you would like to see next down in the comments. And don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more NBA content.